So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, gravitation waves have been detected. This is the first statement, and let us clap for that. So, this is Einstein's centennial gift, because this is exactly 100 years after Einstein predicted the existence of gravitation waves. He gave his theory one year earlier, it was in 1915, and he predicted gravitational waves in 1916, the existence of gravitational waves. And now, in 2016, they are discovered. So it's exactly 100 years after this discovery. So let us see what is the thing here. It's a century long wave. That's what I said here. 1915, Einstein's gravitation was given, the general theory of relativity which is also the general theory of relativity. I mean, many times, I mean, this is how it's called. It's the theory of gravitation. Then, the 1960, Einstein's most spectacular prediction, and this is of gravitational waves. And here's a picture of Einstein, which shows he's writing this famous equation, the Einstein's equations for uh, general relativity. And here we have 2016, the direct detection of gravitational waves. And it confirms the predictions of general relativity also in the strong field regime. Okay. So there are a lot of things which are here, I mean, in this thing, that we have many tests of general relativity, but most of them are, all of them are in the weak field regime. But this is the first test which is there in the strong field regime, where two black holes collide and give out gravitational wave. So this is a simulation of two black holes which are spiraling into each other, forming a single big black hole. And this is the discovery, what has been found. Two black holes, and this was found on 14 September 2015 at 9.50.45 universal time. So here it was something like, I suppose, 3.20 or something, five, five and a half hours ahead. So 3.20 in the afternoon on 14 September, this was the discovery. It was seen in the data. And in fact, three minutes later, it was found actually in the radar. So <coughs> it's a thing, but we had to wait many months. Now it is how many? It was in September, now it is February. So we had to wait five months to wait out that this is, in fact, gravitation wave and it is not noise. So <coughs> this was the thing here. And this is a three in three one discovery. I mean, it's not a discovery which is just of gravitation waves. It is not only the direct detection of gravitational waves, but it is also the direct detection of black holes. We have not seen black holes directly. I mean, we have black hole candidates and so on. We see matter falling into the black hole, emitting X-rays and all kinds of electromagnetic radiation. Or we can see Kepler's, you know, Kepler stars around the black hole, following Keplerian orbits and so on. And from which we can uh, say that this is a black hole. So these are, like for example, in the center of our galaxy. So we have this kind of a, that's an indirect detection of black holes. But this is a direct detection of black holes, because we actually see the waves in a gravitation wave strain. I'll come to that, what do you mean? So, and also it's the first detection of a black hole binary system. So we have binary systems which are seen white dwarf binaries. You've got neutron star binaries, which are uh, small stars, which are not really black holes but they are like a big nucleus, big stars, which are something like uh, 10 kilometers in radius, 10 kilometers is from here to Puna station. But they pack the mass almost that of the sun, little more than that of the sun. So that much mass is packed, say in a radius, corresponding from here to say uh, Buddha station, and you take a diameter, maybe Banner to Korea or something, that would give you uh, this kind of, uh, that's the size of the neutron star. So this kind of things which are, see that you have got uh, new neutron stars going around each other and so on. These are seen but not a black hole binary. So now let us start from Newton's gravity. What do you mean by what is this Einstein theory of gravitation and so on? So first of all Newton's gravity and he gave the so called the famous inverse square law. Everybody knows this from school physics that this is, uh, this is what it is. This is the product of the mass is divided by the square of the distance, the force is proportional to that, to the negative side showing that it's the attractive force, it's the negative things come together. And here are M1, M2 masses, and 
two masses will attract each other and they attract with this kind of a thing. And this theory was extremely successful. So it was a resounding success because it explained so many things. First of all, it explained planetary orbits, the Earth, Earth going around the Sun, the other planets and so on. It also explained terrestrial gravity, that means apples falling and things falling down here on Earth. This sort of thing was explained also by this, by the same theory. In fact, it went from macro molecules to galaxies, they explained many orbits and so on. So then what was the problem? The problem was there, there was inadequacy in the Newtonian theory and it was a conceptual inadequacy which Einstein had found. In Newtonian gravity, signals travel instantaneously. That means if I shake a mass here, immediately the field will be changed everywhere else in the universe. So, I, <coughs> so in principle, I can send my Morse code, for example, a signal from here to anywhere at the corner of the universe, at the end of the universe, with instantaneously. But this was, in fact, this is not possible, as was shown by Einstein himself in 1905 in his so-called the special theory of relativity which came before general relativity in which signals can at most travel with the speed of light and the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So this there was a in fact a need for putting the changing or revamping Newton's gravity and you needed a new theory of gravity and this was the general theory of relativity. So he gave the general theory of relativity and what I'm going to tell you here is in fact a prescription of what it is. So here is a cartoon which I have drawn. The same cartoon for which you have the sun in the center and a planet going around. So in Einstein's theory what happens, the picture is different. You don't have masses which attract each other and so on. You have a mass in the center or something like that. There's a mass there. The mass curves the space time around it. Okay, so there is a mass curving the space time around it and a test particle like the planet okay, follows the straightest possible path it can in that particular geometry. So it's like you have a sphere for example, something like a sphere, a sphere is a curved object. You can't draw a straight line on a sphere. And the only thing you can draw is the, say, the curves and arcs. The straightest possible line you can draw is the great arc of the circle. That's the best thing you can draw. So this, in fact, is a straight line, in fact, in Einstein's geometry. So this is the whole space-time is curved, that's why it's going in this elliptical path or whatever you see here. So this was the basic thing and then you have to give a law as how mass curves and this is where its famous equations which he gave. The curvature is on this side, the space-time, how should the space-time curve? Given the matter, the matter was on this side, the right-hand side and this side was the, you have the curvature. So you have to solve these Einstein's equations, written here they don't look very simple. That difficult, but they are really difficult. There are 10 of the equations, coupled, non-linear and whatever you have. In uh, Newton's theory it is simple, it's a linear equation of a single variable. So the, that's the sort of thing which is there. This is a bad, so gravitation is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. So now we come to gravitational waves. What are gravitational waves? So you have success of general relativity. So we have here, gravitational waves are waves with the curvature of space-time, that's what it is. So, so this is the success of general relativity, it explains equally well falling apples at planetary orbits. Then, but it predicts many other things, the expanding universe. So you see that the ex universe is expanding. So this is also predicted or predicted by the general theory of relativity. It predicts black holes, Newton's theory does not predict black holes. It also predicts gravitational waves and this is what we are interested in here in this particular lecture. So these are like uh, this is a simulation which shows two bodies again going around to each other. You will see it all the time because these are exactly the kind of things which we saw in the, in the particular event which was uh, in fact announced yesterday. So here we have this particular thing. So what are gravitational waves? Waves, these are waves in the ripples in the in the curvature of space-time. Because mass curves space, anything which is moving around or so on will also curve space, but it will produce also waves. And two particles or two masses going around each other will produce waves which will look something like ripples moving away to infinity. So these are gravitational waves and these are waves in the curvature of space-time. 
So how do you detect these waves? So this is the principle of detection. You detect these waves by seeing the effect the wave has on particles. Like how do you detect an electromagnetic wave? You detect an electromagnetic wave by putting a charge there. You put a charge or you put an antenna which has got free charges in it. If an electromagnetic wave impinges on it, the free charges move causing a current which you amplify and see. So here what are your charges? The charges are the masses. So what do you put this? Test masses which are here. And then you see what is the effect on these test masses if a gravitational wave impinges on them. So now here we have a gravitational wave which hits, goes into the pole. It has two polarizations just like the electromagnetic wave. And this what is shown is two particular polarizations. So you take a circular ring of particles and the electromagnetic wave goes into this. That, not electromagnetic, mean, gravitational wave goes into this. That <coughs> ring of particles will be uh, distorted into a ellipse once this way and once that way. And this is the kind of motion that you see. And, but the problem is gravitational wave, gravity in fact is a very weak force. And this is a very simple experiment which demonstrates this. Here I have lifted this glass of water. You might think what has happened. Okay. <laughs> so this shows that gravity is very weak. So how? The whole earth is acting on this, on this glass of water. Okay. The whole earth here okay, <coughs> is pulling down on this glass of water. But my few, uh, my arm is lifting this up. There are only few molecules in my arm okay, as compared to that of the earth. And what is that force which is doing that? It's the electromagnetic force, finally. So if you pull it, go down to muscle contractions and so on and <coughs> break it down, what is the ultimate force? It is, in fact, electromagnetic. So it shows how weak gravitation is as compared to <coughs> electromagnetic. So this is a gravity is a weak force. And therefore, this weak, these waves are also extremely weak and their hence hard to detect. So Einstein, although he predicted the existence of gravitational waves, in fact, in his lifetime, he never thought that such waves would be detected. With that time, I mean, the, given the technology at the time. But now, after 100 years, the technology has improved so much that we are now able to see these waves. We can make detectors to, in fact, look at this kind of, uh, this kind of waves. And you have to measure how much. One part in 10 to the power, 20, the 10 and 22 zeros on this. Okay. One part in 10 to the 22. You can see how much it is. I mean. So, if you want to measure this way, these particles, if you put something, two particles here, this is a very exaggerated uh, image of this. This image, the circles are almost remaining circles. They change by one part in 10 to the 22. And what does that mean? If I take one meter, if I think of this as a one meter thing here, the change is 10 to the minus 22 meters. Okay, 10 to the minus 22 meters is an enormously small distance. Okay, I mean 10 to the minus 15 meters is a nucleus okay, or a proton size. And you are talking of 7 or 8 kote down, so 1 crore down you know, from that. So that's the, sort of, that's the sort of thing you have to measure. So what do you do? You try to make this bigger and so on. So, I come to so you have to measure 1000 size of the proton. So this was, as my esteemed colleague here mentioned, Joe Weber. So here's a picture of Weber with this bar detector. Okay, so here's the bar detector. <laughs> <laughs> so it was in the mid 60s and 70s when he showed this, when he made this bar detector. He says, I'm going to do something great and something challenging. And as I said, many fish swim along this thing. This is what he did the swim, the live fish swim against it. And he was one of the live fishes who swam against the string. And so this he made this resonant bar detectors, but there are limitations to this kind of detectors because they are small. First of all, they are not scalable, they are resonant, they are narrow band and so on. The better kind of detectors, which were again uh, uh, you know, proposed later by Forward and so on. In fact, Forward wrote me a letter after we uh, actually uh, <coughs> Uh, RL Forward, he wrote a letter to me after we published the first letter, first paper, Satya Prakash and Durandar, which appears prominently in the uh, references which are cited in the detection paper of this black holes. So he proposed, <coughs> and he proposed the interferometric design. So the laser interferometer is in fact the right kind of detector to in fact detect these kind of waves. This is a movie showing this detector. It's a schematic, 
you have the laser beam here, the laser here, then this beam goes inside, it comes, comes back from the test masses, it combines over here and then it goes on to the photodiode which is over here. So this is a perfect arrangement in fact for a gravity gravity. So I talked talk about the whole ring of particles, you can think of just two particles here and the reference particle in the center here. If a gravitational wave hits this, the two arms move like this. One arm is compressed, the other arm is elongated. And looking at the difference in the, in the arm, the path length difference, you can detect that on the photodiode. And you look for what is called, usually was called a fringe shift. In the old days it was called fringe shift because you have to misalign the interferometers. Nowadays you don't do that. You align them and what you measure is the intensity that is there on the photodiode. And it shows how if you have uh, <coughs> arms changing, you will have this kind of uh, change in the, uh, uh, in the intensity of the light. And that's what you get. So the, here is the detector, the real detector here. So what you do now with this thing? Because uh, how do you increase this thing? It is proportional to the distance. Okay, the amount of change in the length is proportional to the distance between the particles. So what you do is first increase the distance in the particles. So instead of having a one meter detector, say a tabletop, you make your detector four kilometer size. So here is a four kilometer size detector in Louisiana. This is Louisiana, USA. And here is the center mass. Here is one end test mass. Here is the other end test mass. So you have that ring which I showed is this ring. This whole ring is this, if you think of this. If a wave hits this, that ring will oscillate, will change. And this mass will move, these arms will oscillate or will change in length and you will see the effect on the photo detector here. So this is what is the basic idea here. And this is what you see. Here is the aerial view of the same detector. And this is what you see as the building in this thing. Then this is the arm, one of the arms. It is west and south. The X arm is the west and south arm is the Y, it's called. So one arm is the west arm and one is the uh, south arm. So I think, uh, so that's the south arm and this is the west arm as you can see here. And now you <coughs> go across this arm. So this is the west arm we are going across and you can see this kind of a detector. So then, how many such detectors are there? You need so many of these detectors. Just one detector and all that is not enough. What do you need? This is good that a glass of water is there. Ah, so there are, you need all, all of these detectors because you want to, <coughs> there are many advantages to that. One is the detection confidence, duty cycle, and you can also determine the source detector. These are like antennas, you know, like a dipole antenna in electromagnetism. I mean, it is, uh, you, ca you can't say just with the dipole which way the direction, which way the wave is coming. It's the same thing for a quarter pole here, which is this interferometer. And so you need several detectors which are placed apart in order to actually triangulate a source. You saw it in the movie before. So there are these detectors all around the world. Two of them in the US, LIGO, which is the Hatford, the LIGO, Louisiana. There is a smaller detector, GEO, which is 0.6 kilometers in Germany. There is a Virgo detector, which is three kilometers in size, so which is the kilometer size detectors are the important one. And there are future, is the Kagura detector, which is coming up in Japan. Okay, so these are all these detectors which are there. And one has to battle against the noise. Okay, so noise is an important thing here because you are measuring extremely small, minute effects. Effects are at the level of size of a proton. I mean, if I just shake, the, the ground is shaking at one micron, okay, level of my one micron. How do you get rid of all this? So you need a whole lot of technology <coughs> that goes into it to kill the noise, to reduce the noise. So there are things like the passive isolation, just like seismic isolation, just like what you have in a car, for example. Okay, so things like that. So all these things shows what is there inside the detector, and <coughs> you the main thing is you have to kill the noise or reduce the noise to that level that where your signal slowly starts becoming visible. In that. So there are many things in that. So all this thing which is here, you can see all these things here. This is the tube, this is the cement tube, first of all, which shows. It shows there is a cement tube. Inside that is actually is another tube, which is a vacuum, complete vacuum there. 
and the laser beam here goes inside this vacuum. Okay. So this is the vacuum, this thing in that uh, it should be vacuum. Otherwise, if there are any particles there, the particles will scatter the light and you'll see it. You'll think it's a gravitational wave. That's noise. These are the vacuum tanks and so on. So you have this, you have to fight against this noise. And the fight against this noise has to be done with this lot of technology of lasers, vacuum, seismic isolation, and so on, control system. And everything, all these things have to be there. And they have to, the technology is in fact pushed to, <coughs> pushed to the limits. Now, how far can this detector see? The LIGO detectors, so this is the LIGO detector thing. They can see up to this thing. This is a picture which is drawn here. If you can see this, this is 100 million light years. This is the scale of 100 million light years. So this can see up to 600 million light years. It's 600 million light years. The light year is, as I said, or is something like what? The light travels, how much the distance light travels in a year? That's like something like 10 to the 13 kilometers. A million light years is 1 million times that, 10 to the 19 kilometers. And this is 100 million light years at this level. This is 600 million light years. Then you might ask what source? I mean, the source is two neutron stars, okay, which are say 1.4 solar masses. So you take the sun, multiply the mass by 1.4. Such such neutron stars, okay, which are packed in say 10 kilometer radius, you need compact objects to produce these waves, the stronger waves. These, if they go around each other, these are the kind of objects which can be detected up to 600 megaparsecs when the LIGO starts working at its peak sensitivity. Right now, it is not at the peak sensitivity, it's something like one third its peak sensitivity. Even then, we have detected these black holes. And they are still improving. I mean, this is just the first run of the advanced LIGO. In fact, a few years will go in order to improve the sensitivity of this detector to this thing. And the inside thing shows the initial detectors. What are the range? The range was like 25 megaparsecs. It was about 25 megaparsecs, uh, oh, 75 or 80 uh, light years. Uh, 780 million light years. That was the range. But that has improved enormously. So, what are the kind of astrophysical sources that you see from this? The astrophysical sources we hope to see, this is all our knowledge from the electromagnetic, are compact binary coherences, which are called chirps, where two compact objects go around each other, like neutron stars or black holes and so on. These will merge and give rise to a signal, gravitational wave signal, which is strong enough. Or supernovae. Supernovae are big. You say explosions okay, of stars. And if this is an isotropic, they will give rise to gravitational waves. And these are the kind of sources which could be detected by this kind of detectors. Then there are pulsars, which are the ones which are rotating neutron stars. If, there are, <coughs> if they are slightly, if they have a asymmetry, then this asymmetry can be uh, <coughs> seen. And this asymmetry, if it's there and it's rotating very fast, it can give rise to periodic gravitational waves. Or cosmological signals, stochastic background, which can come from either the early universe or it can come from also the other objects which are there, but you can't resolve that. So there are many of these kind of uh, sources which this kind of detectors can in fact, uh, <coughs> uh, in fact detect. So these are the possible kind of sources and each of the sources are in fact uh, uh, are possible for this kind of detector. So we come to the compact coherence binary because this is in fact the uh, main thing. Your the source which has been detected, in fact, is a binary black hole, and which is a compact coalescing binary. It's called a compact because a black hole is compact, a neutron star is compact. So this is a compact coalescing binary, and it goes and this is a movie which shows how this kind of things, in fact, coalesce and form a single new, a single star. And this, in fact, <coughs> gives you. Uh, gravitation waves and one can in fact calculate what is the uh, <coughs> what, are, what is the waveform that comes from this. Now there was indirect evidence from this many times. So this was by two radio astronomers, Hulse and Taylor, which are their photos are here. This was indirect evidence for gravitational waves, binary pulsar system and emit gravitational waves. There were two pulsars. Pulsars are what? As I said, they are neutron stars which are spinning. But they emit radio waves, so they are like a lighthouse. So you can see this thing. So they spin, they give out radio waves like that. 
and radio astronomers can actually detect this wave as pulses. So these are, in fact, uh, uh, pulsars which is there, which are there, which are going around each other. You see them, the Hulls Taylor binary pulsar, and they go around. And what you observe is, in fact, this: that there is this kind of a figure which has been drawn here, which shows that their period is decreasing. That means they are spinning around each other, but they are coming closer and closer together. As they come closer together, they are, because of Kepler's law, the, as the smaller the orbit, larger the uh, <coughs> larger the uh, speed of the thing, or lower is the period. So the period keeps on decreasing as the stars keep on losing energy. So what is this plotted here is the periostron shift. So the star comes back again to the position a little earlier than expected. And so you can plot the cumulative, uh, you know, periostron time versus the years. It has, this has been observed for 40 years roughly here. And you can see that this is the curve here predicted by general relativity. With general relativity you can calculate how much, how much gravitational waves are emitted by the stars. And you can feed this back into the uh, whole equation of the orbit. So what, what happens here is that gravitational waves are emitted, then you calculate the amount of energy coming out, feed that energy loss into the orbit equation and see what happens, how much the thing is slowed down. And you can calculate this theoretically. And the theory of prediction is this continuous curve which you see here. And these are the observations. They write or not exactly. So you can see that there, this is a in, this is the indirect evidence because you don't actually see the wave. What you see here is the effect of the whole thing, the period decreasing and the whole uh, orbit collapse. And a Nobel Prize, in fact, was given to this in 1993. And this was the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar. So this indirect evidence was there and it established the existence of gravitational waves anyway here. So what are these coalescing compact binaries? So I have shown something here. This is a schematic of two stars going around each other. It's a very good source for this kind of uh, laser interferometric detector. It's a broadband source, best for interferometric detectors. And it's a very clean system. So you can actually calculate the waveform for this thing. The waveform is very well modeled by approximations, which is this thing. And there are, and this is the kind of work which was done by Bala Ayer and his group at uh, Raman Institute, Institute and with, with the French people and a big consortium. And this is, uh, I mean, it's very hard to calculate this waveform. It's not so easy to calculate the waveform because of the fact that Einstein's theory itself is very difficult. It's, it has got an extremely complicated set of equations which you have to solve and you can't solve them exactly, even the two-body problem. You know that in Newtonian mechanics you can easily solve the two-body problem. It's in any standard textbook, Goldstein for example. But here you cannot solve this problem and it has not been solved analytically. And the only thing that you can hope for is approximations or numerical relativity. So you can, you can in fact integrate this equation numerically on a computer. And it's only recently that one has been able to make progress and actually obtain a waveform using computers and numerical relativity. So you have the whole waveform now computed and we have this waveform actually calculated for a coalescing compact binary. <coughs> of course, again, there are not many waveforms which have been calculated. The last I heard about six months back was they had about 200 waveforms which were already there. So now this comes to our work, It is the <coughs> maximum minimum coalescing binary signal. So what happens is that this signal may be there, but the signal is so weak, even then, even though you make your detectors very sensitive and very, uh, <coughs> the noise still is high above the noise, uh, the, the noise is still above the signal. The signal is buried very much inside the noise. And you can't see, so here's a picture here of that signal, which is the strain, as it's called, the stretching, how much the stretching takes place and so on of the space and how much the masses will move. You can plot this, what is called the strain, that is called the strain here. You can plot that as a function of time. This has been calculated by earlier things. And it looks something like this. The, the amplitude as well as the frequency increases in time 
as you go here and find it, there is a coil associated. So this is the kind of a uh, kind of the waveform which you see here. Now if you reduce the amplitude of this waveform and put it in noise, it looks something like this. You can't see a thing in this. You can't simply see anything here. But you have to do a match filtering operation. And if you do a match filtering operation, you see a peak here, which is coming out here. If you match this, then this is the kind of calculation you have to do. It is not a very difficult calculation. You match it with the filter and the match filter and pull out the signal from the noise. So these were the kind of things we had to do. But the point is that there is not, there's not a single waveform. There are many waveforms here. That is because you don't know what are the masses. Each pair of masses will produce a different kind of waveform. One, one solar mass waveform uh, stars will produce one kind of waveform. Two solar mass will produce something else. So you have to span the whole space of waveforms. And one has to in fact extract. You have to search over the space of waveforms. And this was the work which we did actually in this 1991 paper, Satya Prakash and where we showed how is that? This is the paper which has been prominently cited in this detection paper. And uh, so this was the basic <coughs> method which was used. Of course, it has been improved and all that over the years. 1991 is 25 years ago. So a uh, lot of improvements have taken place over the things it has been defined. But the basic method remains the same. I mean, that is that it is the thing. So this particular waveform required something like 250,000 templates <coughs> that they have got to in fact pull out the extract the signal from the noise. So a lot of computation and so on. And uh, so, so you were saying uh, whether, uh, so this was the one in white noise, this was in colored noise, so there is no racial discrimination. So, uh, so here is the picture, the discovery, what has been found. So finally we come to the discovery. So this is the background for the discovery. I hope I have, yeah, I have been uh, not too distinct in this. So what you see is that two black holes merge and form one black hole. So I think I will try to play this again. So here are two black holes which go around each other. It is very slow down a lot, okay, so in this thing, the numerical simulation, and then they are against coalesce and form a black hole. So this is the kind of event that was seen in the LIGO detectors. Okay. So this are the two black holes that burst and form this. And uh, what you see here is what are called time frequency plots. So there's time on this and the frequency on this. The, as you go in forward in time, the frequency increases. And you can see this curve like this. And this is exactly what was predicted by using Einstein's theory and calculating these waveforms and so on. And this was seen in the two detectors, Hanford and Livingston. As I said, there are these two detectors, one in Louisiana and one is in Hanford. And both of them <coughs> saw this with a time difference of 7 milliseconds. So these detectors are separated by 3,000 kilometers. So the time, light travel time is something like 10 milliseconds. The time difference between these was 7 milliseconds, which is well within that 10 milliseconds difference. So it, it went out the thing. So this particular event took place on 14th September 2015-950 UTC. And by doing this batch filtering operations and so on, one can actually estimate the parameters. Okay. So the primary black holes, the two black holes which started off, they were of masses 36 times the mass of the sun. 29 times the mass of the sun. This is the first, the two black holes like this. They formed a final black hole which was of mass 62 m sun. And 62 is uh, 62 times the mass of the sun. And also there was a angular momentum. It was like two thirds the maximum angular momentum that can be there for a black hole. That is called the extremal curve black hole and so on. But anyway, so this was the, all these things could be seen. And this particular event was how many? About 400 megaparsecs or 130 what? Uh, 130, I mean, I have to, 100 to 400 megaparsecs is 130 million uh, yeah, light years. 1.3 yeah. million. 1.3 million. Yeah. Billion, no, okay. Light years away. <coughs> so this was, uh, this was the kind of thing <coughs> which was seen and uh, what you see is that when it goes here, the, the waveform stops and this is where the quasi-normal mode or the rig down comes in and then I have to point the laser pointer to him. <laughs> so he was the one who first predicted this kind of a rig down or the quasi-normal mode. 
and that's over here. Of course, you can't see it in this thing. This is a time frequency plot. If I had shown the time plot, you would have seen the ring down here, but I have not shown it because of the plot. And what is the size of the black holes? You can see what is the size of the black holes. You what you want to compare and know what is this 36 and 29. The size of the black holes are about few hundred kilometers, 200, 200 here. 60 epsilon is like a 400 kilometer size black hole. The diameter is 400 kilometers. So it covers almost a state. That's the size of the black hole, which was finally formed when these two black holes merged. So all this information could be got from this particular event. So how we got the black hole? So this is the So what did India contribute to this discovery? So what did India contribute? So the first was this polynomial mode of a black hole, the black hole rings like a bell. So this is the thing, this is C. V. Vishwasharan, 1970, who spoke just before me. And, uh, and of course, it was Hubert and all these things. So 1970, he predicted this. And uh, later on, Chandrasekhar and his whole group worked on this polynomial mode. And we are sitting in the Chandrasekhar auditorium right now. Okay, so this is the thing, and the whole group worked a lot on the polynomial modes and made a big study of this and you can find all this in his book, uh, Mathematical Theory of Black Holes. And then the next thing was the how to extract and measure gravitational signals from detector data. That was my group here and this was at IUCA <coughs> and we started work from right from the beginning of IUCA 1989 and with Satya Prakash who was my postdoc at the time and other people and who became a later on faculty here and now who is in Cardiff. So there are uh, the whole group of many students, excellent students and colleagues who supported me and supported me in my group. Many of them are here. I mean, there is Sukhan Bose who was uh, was talking to me. There are students around. Some of them, uh, most all of them, most of them had come here, but now they have left to go to the places and so on. But that was the group. And the computations of the gravitational waveform from the inspired and compact binaries were made by Bala and its group at the Robert Research Institute, Bangalore. And this, as I said, involved corrections to the first models called the Newtonian waveform and so on. These are the so-called portable formula. And these computations are very lengthy, tedious, and complicated, and one has to really check this thing out. And even then, you get up to the end, that after the last part is taken over by numerical relativity, when the black holes merge together. And again, you have the ring down, which is again predicted, as I said, by this gentleman here. So, how did they contribute? So, there are, in Indigo LSE, there are actually 62 people, 62 versus author, uh, people there, but there are 37 Indigo LSE authors on the detection paper. So, there's a paper which has been written here, and there are 37 Indigo LSE authors actually listed on this paper. And of course, uh, we are there and much of the group here. Okay, so let's see. So this Indigo, which is called the uh, Indian Initiative in uh, Gravitational Wave Observatory. There are several institutions involved. So there are 12 of these institutions. These are the three institutions here, Ayuka, RRCAT, and IBR. So there are people from, from here who had come for this particular meeting and they are still here some of them. and there are people who are also members from TIFR and ISC Bangalore. So there is a whole lot of people and they are all spread around India here. So we come to LIGO India. Okay. So an Indian detector, uh, a proposal for an Indian detector to be built in India. Why is it a good idea and for the world? First of all, it's a strategic uh, relocation for gravitational wave astronomy because we are very far away from the current detectors. So like uh, we are from US, we are pretty far away. We are almost at the other end of the Earth. And the light travel time is like 39 milliseconds. That's almost the maximum that you can get on the Earth. Earth diameter is, I don't know how much, 40 or 42 milliseconds light travel time. <coughs> So there are, if you have extra detectors, then there are increased event rates, improved duty cycle because the detector is not up all the time. There are upgrades and things going on. 
So maybe 80% of the time a detector is on. The more detectors you have, the more the chance that some detectors are working and so on. So that's why you have got improved duty cycle, detection confidence goes up because many detectors detect the same signal, then you know that it's the gravitational wave signal. It's very difficult that things here and there will have the same uh, <coughs> noise or environmental uh, kind of uh, interference coming in from anywhere. There's improved sky coverage, improved location of the sources required for multi-messenger astronomy, what we call multi-messenger astronomy is things from electromagnetic spectrum, radio, optical, gamma ray, x-ray, so many of them. Are. And you can also, the gravitational wave has polarization, just like electromagnetic wave has polarization, two polarization, so does this. So you can determine the polarization better if you have more and more detectors, and LIGO India, if you add, that would be very good. And what we have is large and strain power is already exists here. Train power, train manpower exists, and facilities exist for that. <coughs> and this also will lead to a potential large science community in the future. <coughs> so that's the reason for having this kind of thing. And I'm showing the same picture again. And what happens if you have here the LIGO India? So that's LIGO India in the thing over here. So this is a proposal for LIGO India. And uh, so this is the these are the detectors which are already there. This is a 600 meter detector, so it's not as sensitive as the other detectors, but it has a lot of interesting experiments and all that can be done because its size is small. <laughs> then this is three kilometers, four, so this was doing upgrades at this time when this particular event went off. So only these two detectors really observed. Otherwise, this detector could have observed, I guess, this particular event. So there are these detectors in the future. The Japanese detector is there, which is the Kana, which is also three kilometers, and this is going to be cryogenic also, so to increase decrease the noise, thermal noise, as it's called, <coughs> in the mirrors. <coughs> and a proposal now for LIGO India here, which is being considered. So if only LIGO India was there, hi. So this is the thing. So if we had it had been there then what would have happened? So right now the thing is that because there are just two detectors, you can only get a circle in the sky because you do, you take time delays from this and see what happens, where is the source. So you get a circle in the sky and basically what you get because of antenna patterns, the pattern is of, there's a pattern also for this detector, you get a shape which looks like a fish. You can see like this, okay, in this case. And so you can't locate the source very well. This source is located within something like 600 square degrees okay, in the sky. Okay. So that's if you what is 600 square degrees. So if you look at the moon, for example, the moon is about half a degree okay, in size. Uh, that's the diameter. So its actual area is like 0.2 square degrees. So this is like 3,000 moons if you put. That is the kind of area. So 55 by 60 or 50 by 60 square if you draw you will get uh, of moons, you put the moons, moons all together like this. This is the 600 square degree area. But if you had LIGO India, this would go down to about 2 to 7 square degrees, depending on where this source is actually. So you get this very small area here. So you can pinpoint the source much better if we had LIGO India already there. And if we had detected the source, <coughs> uh, this would have been the case. So it shows how important LIGO India is if you have to go about, you know, detecting gravitational wave sources and gravitational wave astronomy. So here is a tweet yesterday, last night, from Narendra Modi. <laughs> so hope to move forward to make even bigger contribution to the advanced gravitational wave detector in the country. So this <coughs> proposal is being considered, I think, seriously. So now, what ha what has happened? So with the what's the future now? With this event, we have all become gravitational wave astronomers. Till yesterday, we were not. We were gravitational wave detectors. We were just going trying to detect some events. But today, we are gravitational wave astronomers. Okay? Because we have got, it's, we are doing astronomy with this. And it's a new astronomy. It's opening of a new window to the universe. So existing window, what do you mean by window? There are, all these are electromagnetic windows. So it's a 
electromagnetic window fields, this is in the electromagnetic spectrum. As you change your wavelength, you change the particular window. So there are optical telescopes which started from, uh, which came from, uh, from the time of Galileo. There are radio telescopes which came from 1950 and so on. The infrared, UV, X-ray, gamma ray, neutrino, all these are different windows to the universe. And so now we have an extra window which is coming here, which is the opening of a new window to the universe. It will be a new probe, it will form different probes of the universe and a gravitation wave astronomy. And we hope that this will bring us a lot of new things from this astrophysics, <coughs> from black holes, neutron stars, uh, or stochastic background, and most importantly, unpredicted sources. We don't know what they are. <coughs> Radio astronomy brought us very unpredicted sources. We did. I mean, with optical astronomy, we had not seen many things. But with radio astronomy, we saw new things, like pulsars, cosmic microwave background, and quasars, and things like that. We also hope to see some big surprises from gravitational wave astronomy. So that is the road ahead. There are future uh, ground-based detectors, like Kagra, Japanese, the LIGO India, this is the India plus US collaboration, and on Indian soil, this is proposed and is being considered. And in the future sometimes the space-based detectors will come up, which is called the laser interferometric space antenna of uh, NASA and the LAO is in fact just European Space Agency. And there is DESIGO of the Japanese. So these are space-based detectors. They would have suddenly detected gravitational waves because they are, you actually see those sources in optical and so on. And they will open a low frequency window just like Radio astronomy opened a low frequency window to the optical. So now, this is just the beginning. Thank you. Okay. Just was wondering, you know, the photon we have uh, energy h nu, I mean, for the quantum h bar omega. Yeah. Now, graviton, for instance, uh, what is the uh, general like, principle? You know, frequency probably of yeah. the waves would be that of the consonance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so it will be very small for each graviton. No, but is still the Planck constant coming in or? Uh, yes, yes. It will be the same. go to gra quantum gravity. Yeah. But I mean, we are not talking here of quantum gravity at all. No, of here not. the thing is that these waves are classical. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because the energy is so large. So if you're talking in terms of quantum field theory, it is like. The occupation number yeah, and is, uh, yeah, is like 10 to the 35 or 10 to the 36. It's so it's classical, completely classical. It's Earth per square centimeter or something. Its energy is large, but the effect on particles is very big. That's the problem. Yeah. The G square goes in. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. Uh, so the G, Newtonian constant, is extremely small. Yeah, one rather very quick one. Uh, you, know, you have this Doppler effect on electromagnetic radiation, yeah. right? Frequency shifts and all. Likewise, the gravity. Uh, yes, yes. You would have the same thing. Yeah, yes. Thank you. So that's in fact a relativistic effect, which uh, which is true for anything. Any wave. Any wave. Um, so you mentioned at the end two uh, detectors that um, detect grav gravitational waves in space. Um, mm -hmm. In the final slide, yeah. I was wondering how those work, given mm -hmm. that gravitational wave detectors on Earth have to be several kilometers long. Yeah. Are so these no, really large satellites? Right. The, so the laser interferometric space antenna, which was the earlier thing, it is that design is no more there now. It's uh, it's like the uh, the distance between the test passes, if you call them, which are spacecrafts. The test passes here are spacecrafts, and they are going around in orbit around the sun. Okay. So that would be heliocentric orbits. And you have laser beam which points from one spacecraft to the other. You can't reflect it because it's, uh, it goes and it spreads because of diffraction. Okay. So only one side you can have this thing. You can have a beam. <coughs> like here you, uh, uh, you can make it oscillate and so on. You can make it reflect many times. Here you can, you can, uh, you can make it bounce 20 times, 200 times, 300 times and so on. But here you can do, you can't do that. But you have a laser beam, which uh, and that monitors the distance between that, and the distance can be millions of kilometers. So you you go to the low frequencies in that. 
So you open the low frequency windows like Billy heard. Here, you are, here I can show the frequency band. Here the frequency band is like our audio band. What you see, what you can hear. From 10 hertz to uh, say kilohertz bandwidth. Right now it is like 30 hertz, 20 to 30 hertz. So these black holes which you have seen, we are really, really went from 30 hertz to about uh, three, 300 hertz or 250 hertz or 300 hertz when they coalesced. So you can see very low frequency. The fact that you can go to low frequencies, you can actually get much stronger signals because your masses are bigger. The, the sources for such things are big masses. And the bigger the mass, stronger the signal. Sir, uh, what kind of mirrors are used in Vigo and uh, one of, uh, how did they overcome the problem of brownie behind? Uh, so, uh, one thing is that, what kind of material, I mean, earlier there was silica and all that, but uh, what I can tell you about the brownie noise. So, the mirrors in the, all the detectors, except Kagara, the detector here, they, they will be at room temperature, 300 degrees Kelvin. So there will be brownie noise. So you might think, what is happening? I mean, because each atom is oscillating, and if you calculate kT by m, square root of kT by m, and do this calculation, you will find that it will be like something like 10 to the minus 11 centimeters or something. And that's far bigger than the distances we are trying to measure here. But that is not the thing we have to see. The whole laser beam averages over the whole surface of the mirror. So, and also takes time average during the period of the wave. So it is that average which counts. So it, are, it is actually the resonant frequencies of the mirror and all that which come into the picture, which are in 100 kilohertz or I don't know what is the sort of thing. So that, that's the sort of thing. And the material was, I think, silica and all that. Maybe he knows few silica. Few silica. Super 311. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned that the time difference between the two frictions between uh, Louisiana and this was 7 millisecond, so they are actually separated by 10 millisecond distance. Yeah, so they are separated by 3,000 kilometers. Yeah. So, doesn't that mean that uh, your signal actually traveled faster than light from. No, no, it, it means that, see, if you have two detectors here, and the source is right on top here, you will see that, so there will be no time difference, because they, the whole wave, it's a plane wave, which will come and hit the two detectors at the same time. It doesn't mean anything like that. What this means is that it's a, it just hit at an angle. That's all it means. It's not hit at, uh, along the line of the detectors. See, if the wave hits along the line of the detectors, you will see 10 milliseconds. Otherwise, it will be an angle, some sine theta or something, which will be 0.7 or whatever. Or cos theta, I don't know, which your wave, you measure the theta. Good evening, sir. Uh, I have to ask that source is million, all million years away from us, and uh, shelter in our there will be a diffraction between the source and uh, maybe stars and us, atoms and or other objects. Right. So, ha. Huh, so, one thing which I good you know, this kind of question. So, one thing is that most things are. I mean, gravity again is such a weak effect, it works against us as well as for us. So in this case it works for us because <laughs> it simply doesn't get scattered. Gravitational waves, they travel anything. They, I mean, you can have a source, right, if you build a detector here, you can have a source below the earth. And even that source can, the waves can pass through the earth. Earth is in fact transparent. So any matter and all that is, it doesn't care for that. It's a high fidelity information. So, uh, I mean, and the reason is, G is weak, the gravity, the gravitation is weak, the gravity is a very weak force. It works in that case for us, it also works against us because the waves in fact pass to the detector also. So that's, uh, that's the problem. <laughs> You mentioned the time delay between those two detectors in US. Yeah. So that is basically calculated by the speed of light. Ah, right. So, <laughs> How do you predict the speed of these waves? Right, right. So the gravitational waves, as given by, <coughs> I mean, by Einstein's general relativity, if you think of it as the right theory of gravity, then uh, in Einstein's theory, these gravitational waves travel with the speed of light. 
a speed of whatever, speed, universal speed c. So many times I get uh, this question saying that why do gravitational waves travel at the speed of light? So then I ask back the question, why do gravity, why does light travel at the speed of gravitational waves? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask that for optical astronomy people uh, for choosing a site for a telescope, it's a dark location. What? For in optical astronomy, yeah. you have to choose a site for a telescope, it's a dark location. Right. So, how is the site characterizing? Right, right. So, it's very important to choose the site very carefully here. One thing is that you have to have as little ground vibration as possible. So, uh, things like, or you have to be out of the earthquake zone. Okay. When there are earthquakes and things like that, then it's not very easy to build detectors there. But still, Japan has managed, but I think in that case. But, but on the other hand, uh, we try to do it as, as much as possible away from earthquakes. Then you can't be much near the sea. Because the sea waves which hit the shore, they give you too much noise. So you can't be, you can't go to South India. For example, if you want to build LIGO India, you can't go right up to the, because the India tapers down like this. So maybe below Bangalore or Chennai, it will not be possible to build such a detector. But anywhere up, up would be better. But then there are earthquake zones near Assam and things like that. So, so all those have to be avoided. So that is, uh, so that's how the site has to be chosen. It has to be flat also, because you need an arm which has to be uh, basically flat, flat down. Second platform. Like, uh, what? What is the unit of gravitational wave? How is this uh, Ah, measured, quantified. So you can measure it in terms of usual energy, ergs, or joules, or whatever you call it, in terms of energy. But the uh, thing which we use here is in fact what is called the metric perturbation of the strain. So that is the if you take two masses and a gravitational wave passes through that, how much will these two masses move? Uh, as a fraction. What is the fractional distance this two masses move? So it is one meter and the masses move by say one centimeter, I mean that's an enormous amount. Then you would say the strain is one over hundred. Okay. So that's the thing, how much the masses move. If you take the masses two meters away, they would move two centimeters. That's the, that's the property of the wave. It stretches the space. So Einstein's theory tells you what masses stretch and pull, push and pull the space and time also. Time is also the same thing happens. Right. Yeah. There was, uh, remember reading about, uh, 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 remember reading sometimes the arguments about uh, a space-based detector. Right. There, you have advantages of vacuum and distances are not a constraint. Uh, right, vacuum comes for free. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any updates on that plan? I think there was one satellite launch that was... Ah, that was the... Uh, what do you call this? Uh, Pathfinder. Pathfinder. Uh, what? Pathfinder. 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 Pathfinder.
something else for this curve. So basically beyond 10 kilometers is impossible. 4 kilometers is what is done now. But up to 10 kilometers could be okay. So the more arm length means more... Uh, better, sensitivity. more sensitivity. But you can't go much more than that. Even for 4 kilometers you have to do something. Even that much is bad. So you have to correct for that. <laughs> Uh, what do you call non paddleness <laughs> for the mirrors? Uh, sir, you say that the gravitational waves are coming from the object, uh, they call at each other that black holes. Uh, yeah. In the universe, there are many black holes and they also call at each other. Does not they matter they each other? Each they other what? The waves. <laughs> No, no, any, uh, no, no, you can ask anything, Marathi also. Uh, oh. 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 Ah, so, the thing is that uh, <coughs> such events are very rare, first of all. So, uh, it could be that if you go far enough, there will be you go far enough into the universe, then you will get a lot of such events. And that will form what is called a stochastic background. So, uh, that will be the stochastic background which I showed actually, that was one of the sources. <coughs> so, all of them will, so you will not detect one black hole as itself, but you will detect uh, what is called a stochastic background. So, but nearby you won't get, you are, there are not so many sources, otherwise you would have seen them. <laughs> No, uh, so, yeah, it can, I mean, it's a, fa it's a wave, so you can have, in principle, of course, there can be phase cancellation, but it's so unlikely, I mean, this uh, black hole was uh, 35, uh, I mean, it took place something like in September and so on. So, we have to see what is the sort of the rate, event rate and things like that. It's very small. I mean, it's like, the kind of predicted rates are like few or tens per year or something. That is the sort of kind of rate. Last two questions. <laughs> oh, there are like so many hands up. Yes, still. Okay. Three. <laughs> <laughs> this is <an> option. <laughs> so, so the distance of the source is so huge, like some 1.3 billion light years or something. Yeah. So uh, do we have to take into account the interaction of these great uh, Gravitational waves is dark matter that is in between? Uh, dark matter, again, I said, as I said, matter hardly affects this wave, whether it is dark or not. So, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't really matter that much. Matter doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I was just looking at the masses that you were adding, and I saw three sun mass missing when the two black holes are there. Yes. Uh, was all of that the wave that we received or was it some EM wave also or whatever that is? Yeah, so it is a three solar masses. You are right, good to also notice that. That it came down three solar masses. That is the amount of energy which was lost in gravitational waves. So we didn't receive all of that. It went all in all different directions. We got a very small fraction of it. Because the whole thing because of that, it spreads like a sphere. So we must have got, I don't know how much, anybody has calculated it. How many Earths per square centimeter, I don't know. No, my, yeah. my question was, all of that uh, mass was gravitational wave or lost in something? Uh, no, it was gravitational wave. Does this wave, decay? Decay? Uh, do they come down or the intensity come down? When no, if it spreads, the amplitude goes down at one over r, one over the distance. Yeah, I mean, as you go away from the spherical, it's a spherical wave and uh, it has a certain amount of energy. So, the amplitude, the strain goes down at one over r, one over the distance. Energy will go down as, or flux will go down as one over r square. Not energy, but uh, uh, power per unit area or whatever that will go down and go down R square. Okay. Yeah.
So uh, you said matter doesn't affect the gravitational waves. Uh-huh. But shouldn't the gravitational potential created by the matter affect uh-huh. the gravitational waves? Yeah, I mean that way it can affect. I mean it can pass through matter and all that. So it is possible that it is. Uh, I mean if it's a, another big black hole sitting somewhere and so on, you can have lensing and all that. So that way it can be affected. But it won't be absorbed or scattered too much. So it's just like light, just like light gets lensed, so does this. But uh, when the uh, gravitational waves are emitted, they should have interacted with the uh, many different gravitational potentials because of many other stars. Right. So, uh, how, how do we get But that potential is, uh, I don't know how much it is, I mean it is like, uh, it's not too much. It's, uh, it's a very minor effect. <laughs> Maybe we'll take two more questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that gentleman over there. No, there first. Yeah. So when we can expect another signature of the gravitational wave? It's very hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> when can you expect another uh, such an event? Do you have anything? I don't know. <laughs> Sir, let's ask uh, when the gravitational energy is given out, which uh, exactly particular matter it is? Because uh, if we see light, that is photons. Uh-huh. So in gravitational uh, energy, what, what exactly particular matter is that? Ah, so it is a wave. I mean, it's a thing that it's a, what we see is a classical gravitational wave. Yes. But which matter is it? Because light is photons. Yeah, so here, I mean, you could say that every theory should be quantum theory. So in that way, they could be gravitational, but as, 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 so far as I know, there is no theory of quantum gravity so far as the proper theory. So, so that's okay. You can say gravitational. So, I mean, there is a theory of quantum theory of gravity, but that's another field. That's another thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But nevertheless, uh, with this particular event, I mean, you can suppose there was a graviton. Suppose there was this thing. You can put the limits on the mass of the graviton. With this event, you could put such a uh, such a limit. So suppose there was a mass to the graviton. What is the limit? And that limit can be spread by the dispersion of the gravitational wave. How much dispersion you can put on the limit of the dispersion? Because different wavelengths will travel at different speeds. Right? If it is a mass. <laughs> <laughs>